All right, there we go. Welcome, everyone. And uh, so I'm Lee Chazen. I'm here with uh, Sergey Sputnikov and Vladan Losevic. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a lot of things um, related to Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, Russia today, uh, the war that's going on, and uh, try to get some questions answered because I know there's people out there with a lot of questions right now. And it, it seems like, uh, Sergey, your work, uh, the, the work that you do must be more important now than ever because people want to learn about what is Russia all about? You know, who is, who is Vladimir Putin? Uh, what led to this? And, you know, you, you, live, you lived in the Soviet Union, so uh, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. All right. Well, just for a short introduction, uh, I was born in Kiev, Ukraine, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic uh, back in 1971. So I was 20 uh, when Soviet Union collapsed back in 1991. And I lived for In 1995, I came first time to America to work on exchange program. And then several years later, back in 1998, that's when I had a blind date and ended up staying in America. And since then I live in Michigan. Um, so yeah, uh, and you know, I was totally wrong about this recent events with war because growing up in Soviet Union and growing up in Kiev, it's a capital of Ukraine, but, uh, I'm a perfect product of the Soviet society. I'm a Russian speaking Ukrainian, like in Kiev, which is capital of Ukraine, there was hardly any schools that had Ukrainian language, like Maine. So I grew up speaking Russian, and I still, I speak better Russian than Ukrainian. So like if I say right now, I, I'm i fluent in Russian, then I'm fluent in English, and then third, my third language would be Ukrainian, which I will struggle speaking because I'll be putting in probably English words in, here and there. Uh, so... I grew up, my, half of my friends were Russians, and, you know, it, it was little kind of things here and there. I actually recorded a video about Russians and Ukrainians during the Soviet Union, but it was nothing like a level of hate and distrust that we experience right now. And uh, as I mentioned, people were asking me, do I, did I believe in possibility that war can uh, start? And I was uh, totally like, absolutely, it's not possible. I was totally wrong, as we know it now. And my main reason is like we like brotherly people, you know, Ukrainians and Russians, Slavic people. We have so much in common. Uh, but a lot of things changed since uh, 1991. You know, since 1999, when Putin became a president of Russia, I, you know, when I moved to America, I kind of, I don't watch Russian or Ukrainian TV anymore. I completely remove myself, you know, my family. My wife is an American. My kids don't speak Ukrainian, Russian. Or I'm not proud of it. It just happened. So I'm kind of like got Americanized. So I was removed completely. I didn't understand how much propaganda was um, going on in Russia and how much hate was built in Russian people against Ukrainians, especially since 2014. It doesn't seem like a, a, a natural rivalry at all. And I do have a, a solution to this, which would be um, uh, to just have the Ukrainians and the Russians blame the Jews. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, am, I, I am Jewish and that has happened in history a lot. That would oh, yeah. probably be a nice temporary solution, but I, I'm not serious. Um, but there's no real rivalry between those um, I mean, like Zelensky was a, you know, was a com comedian doing a, uh, a show in Russian to the Russian right. people. Yeah, and and they, they, they liked too. him. Yeah. You know, like, he's Jewish, right? He's a Russian speaking yeah. Jew. And uh, he's neo-Nazi. So this is how people can match this to Russian speaking Jewish person is neo-Nazi government. But this is how good you could be in your propaganda that you can convince people that's totally uh, matching. But you're correct. Back in, uh, we actually had this uh, rhyme. Maybe Vladimir understands it. Yes, if Krania nyet vody, znaci vypili zody. 
If there is no water in the faucet, it means Jews drink at all. That's pretty much what had this expression. So you always blame Jews on everything. So yeah, I kind of grew up, it wasn't that hardcore, uh, but like my father, I mean, his mother, so my grandma, she actually was hiding Jewish family during the German occupation, but they were still quite anti-Semitic. So this is kind of strange. They risked, she risked her life and life of her children hiding Jewish family in her house, but they still didn't like Jews. Uh, but Well, that's the story that I heard too, is that uh, my great aunt and her brother, my grandfather, uh, chased out by the Cossacks, went to Poland first, I think, uh, but the man and his family who kept my aunt in the basement gave her stale bread and tea, uh, but didn't like, didn't like them very well. Yeah. And so when I went to Poland in 1984 during Solidarity, uh, it was on this music tour. And I remember my great aunt was uh, very upset with me because she said the Polish people were not uh, very nice to her. Uh, but they were also helpful at the same time, like you were saying. Yeah, that's a strong combination. So, there are some similarities when it comes to my, let's say, kind of um, post-communist, uh, post-Yugoslav uh, history because I I was born in 1989, you know, when the Berlin Wall was uh, destroyed, basically was removed. And um, <clears throat> my parents were at that time hoping for some kind of a you know, better future, like democracy, economic openness, um, globalization, and so on, and more open and free world. But the opposite happened. We had, you know, the bloody wars in, in, in former Yugoslavia, and especially in Bosnia, where, where I was born. And uh, I remember these things like both during the war and after the war. So partly, you know, how people are behaving in a very irrational, contradictionary, inconsistent way. So the people, the same people who support the war, support war crimes, support destruction, they also say, oh, but, you know, Serbs and Muslims or Serbs and Bosniaks are the same people. And, you know, we are all the same people. <laughs> And um, the war is actually organized by United States and um, NATO yeah. and European Union. And uh, then they also kind of, in some cases, they actually help. Oh, yeah, yeah, I helped a um, Muslim guy or a uh, Serb guy, but only because he was a good, you know, he's a good Muslim, not, not the, the bad <laughs> one. So I, I recognize this kind of rhetoric, this kind of communication that mm -hmm. now has been, you know, that has been organized. Um, mostly from the Russian sides, uh, Russian state propaganda, Russian state media, political narratives towards Ukraine, disregarding territory, religion, identification, nation, people. I really see kind of a repetition of human stupidity from the Balkans in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And... Um, Unfortunately, for example, I have that kind of family background. So many people in my family were, well, let's say not like many, but most of my father's side, they were involved in the Yugoslav, like say military industrial complex in the armed forces, in the government. And for them, I have to say this um, uh, idea of preserving a Yugoslavia at any cost was very vital. So it was so important for them. They, they believed in this kind of propaganda, this, you know, this kind of war machine. And I see this kind of behavior now in, in Russia among many people that they are so, you know, into that, in, indoctrinating that propaganda, they don't realize what's happening, you know, for real, so to say. Back to your question, Ali, about uh, rivalry. Uh, it's very much the main issue is Putin... Uh, is subscribed to idea of the Russian world, Ruski Mir, and the concept that uh, Ukraine was created by uh, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, in the, you know, so created by Bolsheviks in 1922, and that Ukraine shouldn't exist. And that's pretty much like the big idea behind the war is to restore uh, Ru Russian Mir, Ruski Mir, Russian world and take what belongs to Russia and put Ukraine back that it belongs like as a small Russia. There's another term that come up 
Uh, Ukraine is actually small Russia, Malorossia. So you have a white Russia, Belarus, small Russia, Ukraine, and then great Russia, Russia. So there is literally not rivalry, it's just a, we are like small brothers of the big brother, and big brother wants everything back to where it belongs. Well, that's interesting, you know, because I, I went to this meeting on China here in Sacramento. And we had, it was being led by this guy who lived in China and taught there. He wasn't Chinese, but he taught there for eight years and he was giving this uh, lecture. There was a guy there from Indonesia and he said the same thing about China, that we're just all the little uh, children, the, the, the different Asian countries and the uh, China itself is like the father. And we're allowed to go play in the backyard and have friends and run in the street, but they make all the rules. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and so I'm wondering if it's the same thing, you know, with um, this idea of a Soviet Union and all these Slavic states together. And if he has this grand vision, because some are saying I heard this morning on this uh, New York Times podcast that, that there are plans to maybe go further, that the idea was Ukraine would be done in seven days or so. And then let's go to Estonia next. And now let's go to Moldova. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's pretty much, uh, I started paying attention now to Russian propagandists and it's they, uh, like one of them, Solovyov, was really like screaming, you think we're going to stop at Ukraine? We're going to uh, go back to 1997 situation. So that's, next will be Moldova, then of course, Baltic states, and, and Belarus is already entangled with Russia, you know, Lukashenko sold off. Uh, his country for cheap oil and gas a long time ago. So yeah, that's just, uh, it's way worse than I expected. That when I uh, realized, when the, I don't know if you, I, I made a video about it. Uh, one Russian website, Ria Novosti, they published an article on the 26th of February, so two days after invasion. Yes. And, and an article was called Russia наступает, наступает русский мир. So Russia is advancing, Russian world is advancing. And it was pretty much uh, complimenting Putin for making this historical decision on not postponing the Ukrainian question, solving Ukrainian question at his time, because it'll be way more complicated later. And if you remember, some, there is other guy way back was solving another question that was Jewish question. And that was Adolf Hitler. And he was working on his Liber Liebenstraum, right? The yeah, Liebenstraum. The yeah. Liebens space. So this is totally, it's a two, what a piece in the pod with the expression, Putin, Hitler, Russian world, Liebenstraum, solving Jewish question, solving Ukrainian question. Olympics in Sochi, annexation of Crimea. Olympics in Berlin, annexation of Austria. It all goes like it's the same, so just different time, but exactly the same situation. And so, for example, now in, in Balkans at this moment, so in Serbia, and this is also among the ministers of the Serbian government, they're also communicating for the last, uh, let's say, I would say eight months about the, the Serb world. Uh, and they are also communicating about this idea of kind of creating a new Serbia. And uh, Milosevic, that was in power in, in uh, Serbia, like during the 90s, early 2000s, he was speaking about solving the Albanian question. And then he sent the, the army to, to Kosovo province to kill people, to force them out of Kosovo, only, only, only because they are Alb Albanians. And... Um, Unfortunately, these ideas are still living. You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. The thing is that ideas are living longer than humans for the good and the bad, so to say. So 30 years after divorce in um, former Yugoslavia, this kind of rhetoric ideas are still existing. The only thing is now that there are many other ideas that are competing with them. Uh, and uh, what you are describing here, Sergei, with the, the kind of the Russian world idea, I... Uh, I know it's partly connected, connected to this intellectual, like, you know, pseudo-fascist pseudo intellectual Alexander Dugin, who yeah. has inspired Putin with this kind of Euro-Asian idea and so on. Yeah.
and that you still have a massive country in in Russia. Uh, oh, yeah. we love it. Still, you the know. Biggest, still the biggest, largest country in the world. Yeah, it's still a massive yeah. country, and you could still build up your economy. You could build up your tech sector. Well, you know, there's well, plenty of land. It's just okay. that maybe, maybe there's. Track. I'm sorry. Yeah, have, you, have you seen the uh, movie Shrek? Shrek, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is a part that describes Russia perfectly. When they came to that castle, remember that part when they came to this giant castle in Arena of Fire? And they say, sure, it's big, but look at the location. Russia is huge, but it's like Canada. If you move uh, Russia over to Northern America, you know, just kind of overlap geographically, you'll see that it's pretty much like Canada. It's huge, but it's useless. Most of the territory is not good for the humans to live. Like you can live there, but it's really miserable experience. You can dig a hole and mine something out of it, have a little town, but it's really expensive because it's so cold in the winter, building roads is, you know. So Russia is just Canada, even bigger because Crimea, to give you an example geographically, south of Crimea, which is the most southern part of Ukraine or Russia, it's where the Michigan is. Like yeah, I, yeah. Live, I live here, southwest Michigan. This is Crimea. The rest of Russia is north. Yeah. Uh, Moscow is equivalent uh, latitude to Anchorage, Alaska, yeah. I was yeah. told. And then Odessa, I think, is the same as Chicago. Correct. Yeah. So, so even though that's wise, their, yeah, yeah. Russia is it's it's really a bad location. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, no one no one's talked about that part of it, but I'm sure there's some envy that goes on, uh, thinking, oh, Ukraine, you have beautiful access to the Baltic. We don't. You know, we are not Baltic, but the uh, Black Sea. Black, Black Sea. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's you know, I mean the. History of Ukraine is really bad. Like, if you look at the history of Ukraine, it's the country, a nation that got uh, between a rock and a hard place, right? So you had Poland or Austro-Hungarian Empire in the West and then Russia in the East. So it's constantly, you know, they always were separated. That's why there's such a huge difference in mentality right along the Dnieper River. Eastern Ukraine is hard, quite a bit pro-Russian and Western Ukraine is... You know, it's totally, it's different people. Even back in my day when I lived in Ukraine, mm -hmm. those Ukrainians were different. We called them Zapadensi, the Westerners. Like even their Ukrainian language is different. They mostly Catholic. So Ukraine is, yeah, it's a really interesting combination of these two. Uh, both are Ukrainians, but they have a completely different history and different attitude. So... Well, so you brought up, um, you know, the border with uh, Poland or uh, you brought up the fact that it's Catholic. And I remember from my trip there in 1984, there were Soviet tanks in the streets there in Warsaw. Uh, Lech Walesa was in uh, hiding or no, he was in prison at the time. And uh, but the one safe place you could go, this is where we did. All, I was a, a musician traveling with other musicians and we performed in the cathedrals because it, it was a safe place. And we were told that about 90% of the country there was Catholic or, or more. And the, the Russians or the Soviets at the time wouldn't dare do anything to the church. And so I, I'm wondering if maybe that's missing in, in, in Ukraine somehow. Is It seems like the Catholics had the protection of the, I mean, the, the Polish had the protection of the, the Catholic church. It's hard to tell, but it's just, you know, it's one of the reasons I was doubting that Putin will dare to attack Ukraine is because it took Stalin 12 years after the end of the Great Patriotic War to subdue the Western Ukraine. They fought Stalin war machine and covered their regular mm -hmm. troops for 12 years. Uh, so it's like the whole idea that they can just roll into Ukraine and take over in seven days or take Kiev over 96 hours was just like, you need to be on some serious drugs considering <laughs> such a thing yeah. that you can just roll countryside of Texas, 
the second largest country in Europe, population 44 million. And he think we're just going to like kitty cat drop on our back and all right, we're ready, you know, tickle us. So, yeah, it's really strange. Yeah, well, I'm sure Putin wasn't expecting uh, this level of resistance. And I don't think anyone uh, saw, I mean, saw this ha happening. Like when Vladin and I talked the first weekend uh, of the, uh, the invasion, I remember thinking at the time that, that Kiev was going to fall in a matter of days after that. I mean, I myself, I didn't know what to think. I mean, to, uh, first of all, I totally didn't expect. Uh, and another reason was like, besides, you know, all that naive, my naivety from the Soviet days that the Russians will never fight Ukrainians. It's the really bad time to attack in the end of February. It's when Rasputitsa, you know, you have a mud everywhere except roads. So you're stuck on the roads. So attacking with all your equipment, you can't fan out on the fields. You just stuck. So if you watch any videos, yeah. it's equipment stuck and abandoned in the field, Russian equipment, or burned down on the roads. Uh, but you see, Ukraine changed a lot since 2014. Uh, they learned their lesson, uh, and they, I think, realized like that Russian bear will not stop. It will stay hungry. It will eat Crimea. It will eat Eastern Ukraine. It will be keep on going. So they, for eight years, they were getting ready. They rotated like, you know, they have draft in in Ukraine. So they pretty much rotated all their troops uh, through this uh, Eastern Ukraine. So pretty much everyone had a battle experience during their military service. And they were just building up their forces and, I mean, I know I don't know how much America and other Western powers were involved helping out, but they actually built a strategy how to resist Russia in case of invasion. So some people were talking about invasion back in several years prior. So they come up with the strategy that there is no point to fight Russia right at the borders because this is gonna, you know, destroy them. So they just let them in you know, stretch their communication lines. And then they went behind and started chopping and cutting and destroying. So it's, uh, it was strategy in place. I mean, it wasn't, uh, I mean, it was a surprise attack, but they knew what, what to do. And they knew, I mean, there was enough leaked information. I mean, Bill even a German magazine published the map of supposed attack and it's happened, you know, just like that Crimea, from the north, from the south, you know, from all the directions. So it's. Well, what do you what do you think about the um, the American response so far and, and NATO? Uh, I have mixed feelings. You know, if if we look back and if West will do sanctions like they did now back in 2014 when Russia occupied Crimea, we won't be talking right now about war in, in Ukraine. Because that sanction they applied now, they pretty much, they crippled the Russian economy in, in one week, you know. So that's kind of, I blame West for being so, I don't know what the proper word, not so? relaxed. It, it's all about money. You know, I was yeah. telling my friends back in Ukraine, don't expect any serious help from America because there is no oil. If Ukraine had a huge oil reserves, there'll be air carriers, there'll be everything here. I mean, remember Kuwait, little tiny country, and what happened when Iraq attacked that country? So every time there is an oil involved, uh, America really cares about democracy. When there is no oil, there's a challenge. If you just historically you look Iraq, you look, Libya, all those places had a lot of oil. Ukraine well, had nothing. And it's, the response was lukewarm. Let's put it that way. It was lukewarm response, right? And I'm sure, you know, Churchill would have said the same thing in World War II. Look how long it took. I mean, it took us a long time to react to, to yeah. you know, both World War I and World War II. We needed a reason. So in World War I, it was the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, was part of it in World War II, Pearl Harbor. But I'm not sure what got us to uh, war or to help out in Europe. We were very late 
in getting there. Hitler had already taken over Poland, if I remember. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, even there was a period of so-called strange war because British and French, uh, they announced war against Germany, but they didn't do anything besides this little bombing here and there. But it's always this hope that, you know, you can peace the dictator. You can just give him a little bit, you know, let's give him Czechoslovakia and he'll be happy, you know. It, it, it's just, and the same with Putin, you know, okay, he took Crimea. Sure, we slapped him on the hand, you're a naughty boy. He, you know, and it, he's just like, okay, well, let's see what happens if I take you Eastern Ukraine. Okay, still nothing. That might as well go for whole Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's history just repeats. And, you know, I, it's not really like American job to run around the world and, you know, make sure everyone behaves properly, but it's kind of this expectation out there. So definitely... Well, we, all, yeah, we also know what happens when we do get that war machine moving is, uh, I mean, I tell people now that uh, we're still seeing the effects of ramping up for World War II. If you go to any army surplus store, you still see, you can still buy equipment and supplies from World War II. You oh, yeah. know? And uh, it the whole defense industry started then. And war production and we're still kind of a military industrial complex here in the United States because of what we did then. And so if this turns out to be something like that, I think everyone's predicting how just how big it will get, how, how it will escalate. For example, if we if we um, do this no fly zone. Yeah, no fly zone is you, you can't do that. It's uh yeah. it's like a poker game. If you're not playing to play the cards you just bought you know you just was what buff you're not gonna play do it because it's you need to shoot down russian planes that's direct you know kind of attack on russia russia has nuclear weapons so that's totally out of questions the only way they can do it is bring equipment to shoot down plane let uh, uh, you know ukrainians do it just like russia soviet union did it in vietnam they brought their uh, rockets and let vietnamese or uh, russian advisors yeah <laughs> instructors to shoot down American planes. So I see totally uh, proper to do Americans to do the same thing. And I can also add to that regarding those aspects that I, as a, as a European, can feel embarrassed and I can feel it's a very negative experience that, for example, when I was in high school in like 2004, 2005, you know, that period, so I was reading about the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, and I was so kind of uh, supportive. I was so positive and optimistic at that time, you know, for democracy. And then later on in 2014, the Maidan Revolution, I was also very supportive. And uh, uh, one year later, I even went to Ukraine for the first time. But I also know that many people around in Europe, they actually had the completely opposite opinions. They didn't support the Maidan Revolution because... Uh, uh, they would uh, brand it as a far right coup, uh, or they would uh, brand it as, uh, let's say, uh, how to say that it's kind of uh, provoking Russia, you know, and why do we need yeah, Ukraine, yeah, the European sure. Union? Yeah, that kind of behavior. And the thing is that people who, how to say, my experience from Ukraine is that um, many Ukrainians, they feel more, let's say, European than many of us in the European Union identify ourselves as Europeans. So um, so it, in, this is kind of a, in one way a paradox, but that's that's the reality. And um, the I would say like the European Union has still not done enough to provide enough support to Ukraine. I mean, both uh, before 2014 and after 2014. So. so in the West, we liked... Uh, Gorbachev, you know, he seemed like he was going to really change uh, the Soviet Union with glasnost and perestroika, you know, economic restructuring, openness. And there was even, you know, this uh, ban on vodka, which I wanted to ask you about and how that went. Yeah. Um, I, I heard, well, I heard that they, um, there was a potato shortage that followed that because they were making vodka in their bathtubs to replace the, you know, the vodka that wasn't on the shelves. But what's, what was the impression of Gorbachev? And I'm wondering if that kind of paved the way for, we need to go back to when, when we were strong. 
you know, this, I've talked to Vladin about this before too, this kind of longing for the old uh, powerful Soviet Union when everyone felt, you know, it, it maybe affected people on an individual level because they felt they were part of a strong nation. So I wondered if either one of you could speak to that. Uh, well, what I can tell from my experience, well, you know, I was when Gorbachev became a leader. So we're talking like what, 85, 84, somewhere there. Yeah. I was like 13, 14. So I was the perfect age. I was excited about changes. I was at that point when I started kind of noticing, you know, bad parts of living in socialism. So for me, it was always, you know, there was a lot of excitement those years. I wasn't into drinking, so it didn't bother me that vodka disappeared. Of course, there was a lot of dark humor about all that. And, you know, it created, you know, that anti-alcohol campaign besides moonshine. And it also, that's what started uh, drug abuse. Before that, people, there was hardly any drugs. People pretty much drink vodka, or, you know, beer, wine, whatever. It's the shortage of alcohol that's created as young people went. Like in Ukraine, it was always, we always grew puppies. You may, you know, for bacon, you know, poppy seeds. Never had issues with that. Like, you can grow poppies. It was just never even thought. And then in the end of 80s, that's when it became like you can grow anything because people snuck at night at your garden and they cut every poppies to make, you know, heroin. So that was the side effect. And, of course, it was a huge uh, impact on the, on the budget of, Russia, of Soviet Union because – State had monopoly of making alcohol. So by cutting down production, the revenue dropped drastically. But generally, like I remember, it was finally interesting to read newspapers. It was finally interesting to watch TV. Like in the 80s, there was so much excitement just because it was like we didn't know which newspapers to scribe. They all publishing something about Stalin and about you know World War II, all this information we couldn't hear before. So that was a lot of excitement. But of course. After collapse, and then it was quite ugly early 90s. Uh, and so there is a, quite a bit of people, as you mentioned, they, they do miss, you know, everyone respected us. Kind of, you know, we had Soviet Union, we were world power. And this is really bizarre part, this mentality of former Soviets. I, this is kind of flushed out of my brain. Many people remain it. They would prefer to go to outhouse and wipe their butts with newspaper, but knowing the fact that we have the best nuclear missile in the world. You know, it, it's such a disconnect that I'm looking back. For me, it was totally normal. Like, I lived in Kiev, so, you know, like second biggest city in the, in the Soviet Union, or third after Moscow and, and Leningrad. But I drive to in the village to stay with my grandparents, and it's literally like, at least 50 years back or 75, people still use horses to plow fields, no running water, uh, no pretty much like my grandparents didn't have a refrigerator. They used cellar, uh, outhouse, getting water in the well, borrowing horse uh, from the collective farm to plow the field. So for me, it was totally normal. It's just to, you just go out of town and it's like Amish country. But we were first in space, and we all were proud of it. So I totally accepted these two opposite realities of being so advanced in some areas that made everyone proud. And then everyone looks, lives really like basic in the in the country, especially. So a lot of people still, they like in Russia, they totally don't mind having dirt roads that you can barely pass in the spring. But they are so proud that Putin went to Syria to help a Syrian leader because in Syria, it's really important for Russia to protect our interests. I was like, do you see your roads? Like, who cares what's going on in Syria? You know, but people don't mind. There's a lot of people like that. They have that, they want that pride and they don't mind to suffer. Like, yeah, we can wipe our butts with newspapers as long as the newspaper says that we are the best. Wow. Yeah, this is something I also recognize from uh, growing up in Bosnia because I grew up in the, let's say, in the, the Serb part or the part of Bosnia that is called the Serb Republic. This was, you know, basically created through war crimes, through genocide, through killing people and so on. 
And um, I also recognize this kind of mentality, like, you know, yes, yes, we are poor, but, you know, we had this king 800 years ago, and we had this kingdom at that time and large territories. And uh, yeah, now we are kind of more united. And, you know, we just did this and that, I don't know, 300 years ago, 800 years ago. And the 90s was like some kind of a prime time, you know, of, um, I would say, kind of being a Serb and so on. And um, uh, one thing I really wanted to ask you, uh, Sergey, because these are the things that you are telling to people, to your followers on the your Ushanka show YouTube channel. So how did you come up with the idea to to start a show based on your personal history, on your family history, on your experiences, like, and um, how to say, um, how do you experience that it's, that the people are still very, that there are many people who are following you, like really interested in the history of the, not only of the Soviet Union, but also the U- Ukraine during the Soviet times, so let's say. Well, that was kind of, uh, so I work at the local power plant. You know, we make electricity and there's an operator and that job is sometimes during night shifts, it's like you, you've done your part, you, t- you took your readings and then it's like, you just need to be there, right? So there's not much going on. So, you know, people just, they, they say it in America, they bullshitting. They just sit around and they talk about families, about a lot of Americans talk about sports, you know, sports in, and, you know, I sometimes will chime in, you know, they'll say something. I was like, oh yeah, by the way, I remember, you know, back when I was in the Soviet Union and I noticed like it's becomes dead silent and everyone start paying attention. And it's like a lot of information I'll say, they'll be shocked. Like, oh, you were, you know, smuggling vodka to Poland. Oh my God, tell us about it. So <laughs> I noticed there was a lot of this uh, really like pent up interest. Every time I chime in, it was like, hey, by the way, back in Soviet Russia, we did this. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was like, oh, there is really a lot of interest. And then my wife was like, you got such a great stories because, you know, I'll tell my children, you know, about my Soviet childhood. And I was like, well, you know, I'll try it, see what happens. Because I already had a Russian YouTube channel, you know, telling Russians about life in the United States. I was like, well, let me see if I'll do this. And I wasn't sure, you know, with my accent and how that will go. But, you know, there's a specific, you know, group of people that really interested. Some had something with former Soviet Union. Someone went to work there. Some people traveled. And then it kind of became you know, interested in like, oh, I need to learn more about it. And so I, I met a lot of, in, you know, interesting people with unusual histories that, you know, interested my channel. Like I have a guy who went to Russia in late 70s to work on Kamaz. So there was a huge tra- truck factory built. Yeah, yeah. And he went from America to work there for like a year because it's all built on, on a, uh, Western technology. And they never told us that, but you know, equipment came from the United States, uh, all that. So, yeah, that was kind of cool. No, it, it's fascinating. And so I don't know if I, um, I mean, I, I was so intrigued by this myself that in college, you know, I declared a, a concentration in Russian East Central European studies because to me, I thought that was the most fascinating thing in the world at the time. This is in the mid 80s, you know, when Reagan was president. I thought, I want to study this. And so, um, yeah, I just I just had so much curiosity about that part of the world. Yeah, so I, I was going to say I worked on this uh, trade mission in the late '80s. I just it was just an accident that my boss at the time he was running for political office, and I was a political science uh, graduate, and so I was his campaign manager and. He wanted to take these Silicon Valley executives over to Moscow and see if we could get some trade going. And I, had, at the time, was reading a book by Armand Hammer, uh, oh, yeah. the Occidental Petroleum guy. And he had known every single Soviet president since Lenin and, and always had good relations and was able to bring, he was, I think, responsible for bringing you know, Smirnoff uh, vodka or whatever it was to the United States or Stolishnaya or whatever. Yeah. Um, he made that possible because that's that's how they were able to trade. And so I was just honored to be a part of this. And I remember the business owners came back from there. And of course I asked them, 
you know, how they're, we had meetings after they got back. I said, well, you know, is any trade going to be possible? And they said, well, capitalism is new for them. And so the, their business practices are a little bit different than American business practices. And right. so they, they were being offered, um, you know, in exchange for their silicon chips and motherboards and all that kind of stuff, they were being offered, um, you know, either caviar or Russian stack dolls, or in some cases, uh, prostitutes, or <laughs> I heard all kinds of stories. Right. That it's not going to happen right away. <laughs> That's why we don't have Trump Tower in Moscow, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it's very very difficult. Uh, you know, even the correspond was in charge of corresponding with some of the uh, Moscow City con- Council members, and I remember we would get these faxes back, uh, and the type, even the typing, you could tell it was done on a on a typewriter, not on a computer. And we're thinking we're going to need to give, provide some technology just to make this trade possible. You know, that if they, if they open themselves up to the West, uh, this maybe wouldn't be happening right now because we would be, um, there wouldn't be so much unevenness or envy or whatever. I, I don't know what's going on. It's just, it's not as far developed as I thought it would be by now. Yeah, it's, you know, that's why when people tell me, uh, look what capitalism did to Russia, you know, that, you know, all this poverty and people, you know, their lifestyle drop. And I tell them, uh, this is what happens when you let a former communist build capitalism. They don't understand how to build. They only know how to steal. And that's pretty much it because Russia never got occupied by United States. America never came in and forced that the you know barrel the gun. Now you build capitalism right now, and we'll show you how. Russians figure out themselves, and at all this crazy nineties we had, it was pretty much wild, wild west Russian style. You know they were just privatizing state companies, stealing, and people who you know you got factory. And you know you got it illegally, so you know anytime government can turn around and take it away from you, so you just exploit, you don't maintain equipment, you're just trying to take all the profit you can and run away before they'll get you. So this this introduction to capitalism by communists really didn't work really well for most former Soviet republics except Baltic states. Yeah, it ended up in state capitalism and, and crony capitalism. <laughs> yeah, it's you know Putin kind of <laughs> got it organized into his version of uh, how the thing's supposed to be running. So yeah, it's very much yeah state capitalism. Every oligarch pays uh, you know twenty percent uh, fee for running business to Putin, and then every oligarch has a government official attached to him that he provides him with services like you know vacations on the, this million dollar yachts and staying in some cool places. So yeah, that's uh, it's quite an interesting system that they design here. There, yeah, I think uh, education might be the answer. That if we could get, you know, more young uh, Russian students into schools where they learn, you know, about op- other opportunities, um, right. other systems, other philosophies, other ways to do business, cryptocurrencies. I mean, yeah, and <laughs> I'm I'm not saying. I don't mean to say that in any type of a uh, we know best attitude, because we certainly need to learn a lot ourselves uh, here in this country. I'm sure, uh, Sergey, you have, um, you know, it's it's not all perfect what you've seen so far since you've been in this country. I mean, I I came to America in 95 and I worked uh, as a lifeguard in the inner city kids from Chicago camp. So I, I went through like almost back door. What I saw at camp, I was horrified. I mean, I wrote a book about it, <laughs> but yeah, that was just, a, it was total shock uh, culturally. And, you know, the fact that even such a little, you know, I'm talking to kids, you know, about life in Chicago and I noticed in the, most of them saying my mom and my boy and, and her boyfriend It's like, literally, I hardly heard not many children to say my father. And that was such a shock because I don't recall anyone back home that mothers had boyfriends. The whole concept, like if your mother 
should have a father, you know, if we have a family, so this whole this, uh, my mom and her boyfriend thing was just like, where are your fathers are? Like, why your mothers have boyfriends? So even like that part was pretty wild. Yeah, you'll, um, there's so many stories about American culture um, that don't make it into uh, movies or, you know, they, they're not seen over overseas. And so everyone has kind of this distorted vision of what it's like here in the United oh, States. Yeah. But I mean, I can drive just 10 or 15 miles south of here. And I don't want to say it looks like a, uh, it would be wrong to say it looks like a war zone. It, it doesn't, but uh, there are some, uh, some people really suffering, not doing well. And when I lived in Nevada, uh, I lived in this uh, area that when I first started teaching and I wasn't making much money, I, I was living in a trailer with a, a friend of mine who was also a teacher. And we were right on the edge of an Indian reservation oh of the, God. I think the Washoe Indians. And during the middle of winter, I got in my car. Um, I was just curious to see what the reservation was like. So I drove, I had a four wheel drive at the time. So I went one of those little Suzuki samurai cars. <laughs> and so I drove over to the, uh, to the reservation and just easily went through, but I saw uh, a lot of people, you know, drinking and, uh, just sitting outside of their trailer, you know, three feet of snow on the ground, and it just did not look very nice at all. Right. Um, and my friends who taught on a uh, friend who taught on the reservation came back with stories that uh, you know don't. He was trying to teach American history, you know, to to Native, Native, Americans. Native Americans. It's like you're that's your history, right. <laughs> and he wondered why they were so angry. Well, it was my, like, I even have a silly example, you know, in the, when the American Hollywood movies started coming in, you know, mostly end of uh, the end of 80s, uh, I had this weird, you know, all you see is just pretty magazines and then movies. So I had this weird idea. It's just formed automatically in my head that all Americans, women are super hot. So when I got to New York, <laughs> you know, when I was stay first day in New York City in uh, Columbia University, we went for a walk and I have this like, all right, let's see <laughs> this hot looking American chicks. Yeah. And I was like, what happened here? Where is all this supermodel supposed to walk on the street or all here? Like, you know, so even that is just, it, it, it just programs you when you watch America through TV, through movies, magazines. It creates this, you know, picture of perfect smiles and perfect skins and beautiful looking people. So, yeah, even that was kind of like, whoa. Well, that's, like. you know, so you would think that on social media, it'd be more realistic. Like, oh, you anybody can put stuff on their camera and right. but everyone does their own editing. And so they only put the best stuff on there. Oh, yeah. for the world to see and if you didn't know any better you would think everyone around you is doing so well they're so beautiful everyone looks perfect yeah. in their pictures so uh to wrap it up is there are there any uh are there any uh, loose ends or things that we didn't get to uh talk about oh. I just want to quickly add about back to the sad topic of war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way I see, you know, Russian plan failed. They wanted blitzkrieg. They wanted to take over Ukraine in short period of time, change the government. So right now I'm just wondering which way you're going to go. Is it going to go the way like Finland, then the lost territory, and it's going to go the way that Russia actually, there'll be a blowback and Russia going to shatter and fall apart. So that's kind of what I'm right now really watching what's going on. And of course, you know, my family is still in Ukraine. My mother is in occupied territory right now. So that's adds a lot of stress. And my, you know, brother and my father right in Kiev. So that's, yeah, that's what right now is really. No, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I for. Go ahead, Vlad. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I really feel you, Sergey. I'm, 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 I've been a war myself and. I, I feel the, the pain. I had a conversation yesterday with my colleagues in Kiev, and I was um, I was like like this during the whole Zoom call. I was not able to concentrate, and um, 
Um, just to tell you, I, I'm hoping for a second Maidan in Belarus, in Minsk, and for a third Maidan in Moscow. Yeah. That would be great. You said uh, Maidan? Yeah. Well, it's like a revolution, pretty much. Oh. You know, people are rising. It's the area in Ukraine that's called Maidan, which is, means like a square, you know, like oh, city right. square. In Ukraine, it's Maidan. And that's what was happening. So that became like a word for people's uprising against oppressive government. You have a Maidan. Yeah, because I remember Zelensky talked about uh, Freedom Square. That yeah, every what, yeah, every, a, every town will have a they call it, yeah. Yeah, he said that every town would have a Freedom Square at, at the end of this war, and I just think when I see them uh, protesting the occupation in some of these cities, I just think how courageous any one of them could be detained or shot, and just yeah. so. Um, I've never felt such intense emotion as when I was at the rally here in Sacramento uh, the first weekend, I think, after the war started. It was on that Sunday. And uh, there's this uh, Slavic population here of about 70,000. I oh, think wow. uh, um, there were several thousand at the at the rally, uh, but 70,000, uh, half of which are probably Ukrainian, I think. Uh, it's a big population here. And just being there and hearing the music and hearing the prayers. It was a very religious group. Uh, it, it, it was filled with so much emotion. Uh, there, there is some, um, I've never seen this country as united uh, on, on one side of a war as this one. Right. Now that's, that's good news. I mean, there is still hope then. Yeah, and, and and had I known that your family was still there, I probably would have approached this uh, conversation differently. Um, I just hope the best, you know. For no, it's just, you know, I keep it like too parallel because I still have to function here and you know, do my work, everyday things. So it's uh, I check with my family, make sure okay, and then I'm back to you know what I'm doing here. Yeah. Well, so finally, what would um, because I. I've talked to like I've, I talked to a Marine, a retired Marine who wants to go fight. And I've talked to others who don't know really what they don't really feel like there's anything that they can do. But when I talk to Vladin, we think that, you know, this is an information war going on here. We can help by giving people the correct information and spreading the word. Yeah. What, what do you think? What do you think is the best thing that anybody can do? Well, that's what I do. But, you know, I, I speak fluent Russian, so I until I'm banned on the Russian social media, I pause there, you know, carefully because I don't want to anger people because there's plenty of pictures of dead Russian soldiers. Of course, you don't want to do anything like that. But I'll post some kind of like, hey, this war is not going really well for Putin, you know, so, but, it, but I'm Russian speaking, so I can, you know, I apply that on my Russian YouTube channel. Uh, but otherwise... At this point, yeah, I, I think there'll be more opportunities to help when it's over, when, you know, to rebuild the country. Then probably we can figure out where is the best way to support with money, with equipment. Uh, but yeah, currently it's honestly just if anybody says anything, you know, supporting Putin, then definitely needs to have a conversation and find out why and explain, you know, that uh, he is actually a criminal, that kind of danger for the whole. Very much for the whole world, because, you know, he's really close to that red button. So, Yeah, uh, well, it'll come down to some good negotiating skills. Uh, he's going to get something out. of. They're trying to give him a, 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 an easy way out. You know, here you can have this or this. You can have we won't uh, attack Crimea. You can keep that or uh, Ukraine will be a part of the EU, but not be a member of NATO or, you know, you can have this part of the territory but not this you know it's going to it's going to yeah. come down to that uh i said i had impression that if you don't make uh russian bear angry he will stay in his woods but i was uh, totally wrong uh, i don't know what is the english word uh, in russian they called medvedge shatun so you know bears go uh, to hibernation in the winter right um, but some bears wake up in the middle of winter. They're hungry, they're starving, and they it's the most dangerous bear. It, it will attack anything. 
what I see Russia under Putin is Medved Shatun, is that un- hungry bear, you won't get, you can't satisfy him. You give him a Crimea, he'll eat it and he will want more because that's kind of like it's their mission. He put himself on this mission to rebuild and degrade Russia. It's not about protecting Russian speaking population, all that blah, blah, blah. It's not about NATO. It's about uh, restoring this great Russia and that bear won't be one stop until he gets it, you know. So. Well, so that suggests to me that you do the opposite, which is what we did. As much as I didn't agree with Ronald Reagan, maybe back then, um, you know, you, you overwhelm them with uh, force and with money and with weapon systems and with rhetoric and you yeah, appear yeah. powerful because the bear will run away if you look either crazy or large or both? It's, you know, I don't know how to restore democratic institutions in Russia because the West let it be destroyed in the last 20 years. I mean, we will watch how he destroyed everything, you know, independent media, any opponents, any journalists. I mean, there's so many people get killed and nothing came out out of it. So it's it's a big challenge, but that bear won't stop. It's You, you can't please him. You it has its eyes on Moldova, on Ukraine, on Baltic states. Until it became Great Russia again, it will never stop. So that's my opinion. So I was, it's changed me, turned me 180, because I was quite a, let's not make it angry, angry, but that bear was, it was just a question of time. Clock was ticking. When bear felt strong enough, they went for it. So, Wow. Um, I, I don't know where to go from there other than to just thank you uh, for your time. And hopefully sure. we have like a little discussion when I turn off the recording button, because uh, I have some uh, things to talk to you guys about really quickly. But um, yeah, uh, Sergey, I wish you the best and, and especially okay. on your YouTube channel and with your family and Vladin, uh, same to you. You're in uh, back in Sweden. You're safe uh, for now. But uh I appreciate your contributions to the conversation too. Uh, I think people will learn a lot from, from things like this. They will learn, and this is how we, we change minds, change opinions, is to give them better information.